Hello, my name's Adrian Goldberg and welcome to a special edition of the Byline Times podcast featuring Zarina Zabriskie's Ukraine War Diary. Zarina is a regular correspondent for the Byline Times and other news outlets. We thought it would be useful to get her insights across a single week of the conflict. We'll hear later about Russia's nuclear blackmail and meet Yaroslava Antipina, a Ukrainian using the power of social media to show the beauty of her war-torn country. We'll also have reflections on the rise of anti-Semitism in Russia in the wake of the fighting in Israel and Gaza. Zarina's first dispatch, though, is from Kherson, currently under sustained bombardment from Russian artillery. The Black Sea port was occupied by the Russians for eight months in 2022, before being liberated last November. Since then, it has been pounded relentlessly from the other side of the Dnipro River. You'll hear the voice of war photographer Paul Conroy, as well as that of Zarina. Friday night around dinner time, there was a horrendous explosion we rushed out to see what's going on and to report. There was a massive explosion earlier um, and the rumor has it, but where on the street is that it was a ballistic missile. We were going to investigate, but we're just waiting to see what the situation is now because there's been a, a massive couple of artillery strikes that's still going on. I think there's another just hit, or it's about to. That's possibly 152 heavy artillery or grads, one of the two. Pretty much everybody reports that they saw the red flash and then heard the crashing sound. Driving around is the wisest thing at the moment. Probably not. <laughs> uh, I was outside building in a balcony, so uh, the first that uh, I noticed, I saw the flash uh, with my back view. After the flash, I see explosion, very, very big. And after that, uh, after a few seconds, I was hit by sound wave. It was terrible. It was very horrifying. Next morning, I went to the site where the missile hit and spoke to a few eyewitnesses and also eventually in the evening to a volunteer, American volunteer, Carl, who is here in Kherson working away and helping. So we had uh, just finished cleaning up this um, strike. It was very close to where I live. And uh, we're able to um, remove all the bricks, all of the concrete, the steel, you know, and we secured the home with plywood. And then we went to another uh, place. One of our friends called in and said their roof was blown away. So we, um, we went over there, we assessed it, and we're finishing up right now. We're having to put a blue tarp on it. About 20 meters of their roof is gone. And then uh, we were driving back home and 650 feet from where I'm sitting right now was blown up. There, the strike was, was huge. It, it leveled this building with one hit. All of the windows on the street, which is right where I live, they're gone. They blew all the windows out um, that were near that building. And so, uh, yeah, that was bad. And, uh, and of course, I didn't know exactly where the hits were uh, because late last night, you know, at night, we're not allowed to go out uh, where there's curfew, right? So we, 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 we try to obey the laws. But, but anyway, so the strike was just really daggone close, and, um, which is why our building was shaking and, you know, so forth and so on. But uh, th this is what we do so that we can help people, right? So all the volunteers that were there today, um, a bunch of them were from Europe. 
So I got, we got guys from Germany and Canada and me and the Ukrainians, and we're out uh, working all day. I'm actually pretty tired. It's a good kind of tired. So today, the air raid signs were on, oh, sirens were on all day. It, it, it's just crazy here in the Kyrgyzstan, and we've had some explosions already this evening. But we do these things, all the volunteers are here so that we can help people, right? This is what it's all about. It's not about the explosions and the, you know, obviously we don't like them. Nobody likes them. We certainly don't want anybody hurt or, you know, but we're here because we want to help. That's why we're here. The only reason we're just here to help, to do what we can do to bless our Ukrainian brothers and sisters and uh, to see um, and to stand with them as we stand against the enemy, uh, the, the terrorist nation that's constantly trying to destroy this country, the people, and to break up morale, which they can't do. It, that's impossible. That's Carl, a volunteer from the United States in Hesson. I'm Adrian Goldberg, and you're listening to a special edition of the Byline Times podcast featuring Zarina Zabriskie's Ukraine War Diary. This podcast is funded by subscription to the Byline Times, our brilliant monthly newspaper, which is now available on selected newsstands. It's what the papers don't say. Head over to bylinetimes.com for details of how to subscribe. Next up, Zarina on Russia's nuclear blackmail. Before Putin's invasion, Ukraine was heavily dependent on nuclear power, which provided about a fifth of its energy needs. The country is home to 15 nuclear power stations, including Europe's largest, Zaporizhia, as well as Chernobyl, the site of an explosion in 1986 that released large quantities of radioactive contamination into the atmosphere. Despite the obvious risks, Russia has continued to wage war in and around these sites, including a drone attack apparently targeting a nuclear power plant in Khmelnytsky at the end of October. Lately, Russia's apparent nuclear threats have raised significant concerns. But this is not the first incident of the Kremlin's nuclear blackmail. In fact, the nuclear plant's threats are critical to understanding Putin's disinformation warfare. Chernobyl power plant has been a subject of disinformation campaign with allegations of Ukraine developing a, quote, dirty bomb, unquote, and potential false flag events. The day following the full-scale Russian invasion in Ukraine, February 25th, 2022, Russian state-funded media repeated an allegation from Putin that Ukraine was developing a dirty bomb in Chernobyl with the collaboration of Western partners. Within days, the story had escalated with the Kremlin-funded RIA Novosti agency quoting a representative of the Russian Federation declaring, I quote here, Kiev used the Chernobyl nuclear power plant zone for work on the manufacture of a dirty bomb and the separation of plutonium. End of quote. The claim alleged that Ukraine and its partners were using increased background radiation in the Chernobyl zone to cover up this plan. Chernobyl has also been presented as a possible target for a false flag event. The main intelligence directorate of the Minister of Defense of Ukraine said that Putin was preparing a man-made catastrophe on the Chernobyl plan, for which Russia planned to blame Ukraine. In August 2023, Ukraine's National Resistance Center reported Russia's preparation for a provocation at nuclear power station. In October 2023, just recently, Putin spread unsupported claims of Ukrainian saboteurs, so-called diversionary groups, DRGs, allegedly targeting a Russian nuclear power plant. This narrative is used to justify potential retaliatory strikes on Ukrainian nuclear facilities. 
On October 26, the Russian Defense Ministry claimed air defense systems intercepted the drones in Kursk Oblast. According to this report, three drones allegedly targeted Kursk nuclear power plant located near the Ukraine-Russia border close to Sumy Oblast. The attack had no impact on its operation, according to the report. Meanwhile, reports of such drone attacks are common, with Ukraine occasionally claiming responsibility for attacks. Continuing the nuclear blackmail tradition, Russian forces targeted the Khmelnytsky region in Ukraine near the Khmelnytsky nuclear power plant on October 25, 2023. These attacks resulted in damage in the vicinity, with the Russian drone crashing near the plant and causing harm to administrative buildings and infrastructure, including schools, kindergartens, and a hospital. These attacks continued for four consecutive days, causing significant damage in the town of Slavuta. These Russian strikes caused extensive damage, impacting around 300 residential buildings and injuring 20 people, according to the mayor. According to Zelensky, the target of these drone attacks were likely the Khmelnytsky nuclear power plant. At the same time, Russia conducted exercises simulating a massive nuclear strike involving various strategic nuclear forces, ballistic missiles, and long-range missile carriers. This development coincided with the revocation of the ratification of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty by the Russian government. Needless to say that the occupation of nuclear power plants by Russian military forces poses significant risks. Military operations and fighting in the vicinity of a nuclear power plant are extremely dangerous. Stray bullets could hit reactors and nuclear waste storage structures, causing the release of radiation. Such leaks threaten nearby towns, while radionuclides carried by the wind can travel far and wide. When this happens, radioactive rains poison those on the ground, causing severe illness and death. The wind can carry radionuclides towards Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, and the countries of the European Union, even as far as Scandinavian countries. The biggest nuclear power plant in Europe, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, has been occupied by the Russian military since March 2022. The Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, with its vital role in Ukraine's electricity production, faces dangers related to spent fuel storage, power supply, overheating of working units, and sabotage of safety systems. A catastrophic event at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant could result in a situation similar to the Fukushima nuclear accident affecting Europe, Russia, Belarus, and causing environmental and humanitarian crisis. On October 29th, the Russians put the fourth and fifth units of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant into a hot state, said the acting director, uh, head of the State Nuclear Regulation Inspectorate of Ukraine, Oleg Korikov. Today, at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, in accordance with the term of the license, all six power units must be in a cold state. In violation of the terms of the license from the State Nuclear Regulatory Authority, the Russian invaders transferred power units number four and five to a hot state, meaning they warmed them up to nominal parameters. In addition, they intend to assemble power unit number three, which is now dismantled and being repaired. This is dangerous, Korikov said. While the situation is developing, we speak to Yaroslav Antipina, a photographer and writer from Kiev, originally from Khmelnytsky region. 
Her project of presenting Ukrainian art and culture to the world is really popular with the international community. Last week, her family was affected by the Russian attacks on Khmelnytsky region. Here is her story. Mom and sister live uh, in Khmelnytsky Oblast. It's not far from a uh, uh, nuclear power plant. It's 30 kilometers from there. The recent attack was really strange because it was the first time they were attacked during this uh, full-scale invasion. Their town all started 2 or 3 a.m. As my mom told me, uh, it was uh, really awful because the house was shaken. Mom said that the sky was red. Uh, she quickly uh, went outside and there were a lot of people, neighbors, some windows uh, on the upper floors were broken. Mom told me that uh, there were a lot of damage. And it's a very small town. A few thousand people live there. Can you imagine that all schools and all kindergartens were damaged? 22 of them, 300 uh, buildings were damaged. A lot of damages were in the city center. For this small town, like tragedy, and also because of the closeness to this uh, nuclear power plant. It was really dangerous. It was very heartbreaking uh, for me to hear mom tell me when they went out at night. There was a little boy, he, uh, he lives uh, uh, upstairs, five, six years old, and he was crying. Uh, my mom asked what, what happened, and he told that uh, the window in his room was broken because of the explosion, and his cat jumped out. So he was crying and looking for his cat. Yesterday, when I talked to my mom, I asked what's happened with uh, this story. And unfortunately, she uh, she didn't know. And today I'm going to ask her once again. You know, it was uh, maybe too small in this, um, too small tragedy in this uh, whole tragedy of the city of our country. But for this boy, it was a very big tragedy. These are children whose childhood is being taken away from them. My sister saw more because uh, the explosions were very close to her house. I called her and she told me that her husband asked them to lay on the floor because it was very loud and she has three children, uh, small children, and these children were very scared. I thought about people in her son, in Mariupol in uh, other thousand, uh, thousand and eastern regions of Ukraine. And uh, this, the, the people experience this every day. And as for the injured people, uh, the mayor of the town said that 20 people were injured. Two of them were in critical condition. And also my mom told me that uh, when she went out that night, she saw these explosions where my sister lives because she lives nearby. You can see the, the house. She tried to call my sister and she didn't answer. Yaroslav, we know that you've been sharing your photographs and also your meandering around Ukraine, looking at Ukrainian art, at Ukrainian culture, and present it to the world. And people are very hungry for it and very grateful to be reading this updates. Can you tell a little bit about this experience? It was started uh, in a very strange way. This summer I went uh, on the city tour because I wanted to see more of Kiev. And uh, when the two guys started talking about some sculpture, I realized, oh my God, I didn't know anything about him. So I decided that I need to dig more in Ukrainian culture and just uh, wrote to tweet, okay, guys, I'm going to do this. Would you like to go uh, with me on this journey? And uh, it all started like that. Uh, when I uh, began digging in Ukrainian culture, art, literature, etc., I realized that for centuries Ukrainian culture was just uh, a tiny part, or even not part, but it was uh, something in the big Russian culture. Ukrainian artists, Ukrainian writers were called Russian writers and uh, artists. I decided that maybe it will be some kind of mission. I don't like this word, this mission, etc. But to show to the world that there is Ukrainian culture and it is rich. And Ukraine is not Russia. 
and uh, we have a lot of beauty to show to the world. And I want to show the past, our glorious past. And for example, such artists as Rebin and Malevich are not Russian artists, but Ukrainian ones. Gogol isn't a Russian writer, but Ukrainian writer. Also, the modern artists and modern culture we have. I enjoy doing it. It's not very easy during wartime. All the collections are hidden and we can see sample exhibition. I'm happy that it is done because during previous wars, a lot of collections were stolen, destroyed, etc. But it, it, it's hard for me to see anything, so I tried to buy books. What were your favorite and probably most surprising discoveries, journeys uh, throughout the last almost two years? The place is beautiful in its own way. And I had really a lot of discoveries. Probably uh, the most surprising for me um, was that museum, Ukrainian village. It, it's not far from Kiev, and I didn't know about it. And they have different houses, Ukrainian house, villages, houses from the uh, 19th century. And it's really beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah, I want people after victory, of course, uh, uh, come to Ukraine from different parts of the world and see uh, and see these places because they are really magical. That's very, very true. I've been traveling a lot around Ukraine. The road takes me to the most amazing places anywhere from the very east, you know, with Chernihiv and Chernobyl and all the way to the west and to the south. It's just such a diverse culture. There's so much to explore. So we hope that you continue with your project with the presenting culture from different regions of Ukraine and the art to the world. And I would ask uh, people to follow you at um, Strategy Woman at Twitter or X as we know it now. Meanwhile, what's happening in Russia itself? Zarina has been talking to an expert about an alarming rise in anti-Semitism provoked by the conflict in Israel and Gaza. On October 29th in Russia, angry crowd in Dagestan, which is a part of Russia, storms Mahachkala airport on arrival of a flight from Israel. Crowds inside the airport and on the runway were waving Palestinian flags. Videos and photos showed anti-Semitic signs with slogans against Jewish refugees. Clashes resulted in at least 10 to 20 people injured, according to different reports, including two in critical condition. The airport was temporarily closed and flights were diverted as unknown persons breached the facility. In multiple other places in Northern Caucasus in Russia, there were reports of anti-Semitic protests. Today, we speak about this outburst in the context of current events with Vyacheslav Lihachov, expert council member at Center for Civil Liberties, head of the National Minority Rights Monitoring Group in Ukraine, former senior fellow at United Nations Human Rights Monitoring Mission, among other things. Vyacheslav speaks to us from Kiev. Hi, Vyacheslav. Can you please provide an assessment of the development tendencies and the situation of anti-Semitism in Russia, uh, especially in comparison to Ukraine? It is not easy to compare the situation in Russia and in Ukraine. First of all, because Russia is not a country with uh, free uh, media, with a free democratic political process. So more or less everything which we can hear or which we can read in uh, the Russian informational space was published or was taped because the government allowed it or uh, the government requested it. It is not the situation with uh, free informational market 
as in Europe is, as in Ukraine is. Uh, so of course in Ukraine, we can see a number of different anti-Semitic propaganda, uh, the types of anti-Semitic propaganda, including old style, religious, traditional one, including this more modern uh, US cultural uh, type style of anti-Semitic propaganda. Uh, we had some conspiracy theories during the COVID era, but uh, it all is not like in uh, authoritarian atmosphere in Russia where anti-Semitism is uh, public when it is allowed. It is, it is not uh, possible to compare, I don't know, number of cases or uh, level of anti-Semitic propaganda because it is not possible to compare the informational phenomena within the in society with free informational space and society under the authoritarian control. So what is important to know about um, the Ukrainian anti-Semitism, we had some incidents, we had some acts of anti-Semitic vandalism before the large-scale Russian invasion. We had not literally zero, but literally one or two cases per year since the beginning of the Russian large-scale invasion. Maybe it is the lowest number of anti-Semitic incidents in whole Europe. We had a president who is an ethnic Jew, which is a unique situation for European countries. We had no one pro Hamas public events during the last three weeks. It seems that the Ukrainian society is totally feel uh, solidarity and empathy with uh, Israel after the horrible terroristic act on October 7th. It is not like in other European countries where we do hear different voices. But in Russia, when we can see anti-Semitic uh, incidents, it means that uh, the government directly or indirectly allowed it during last months or maybe even during last year. We have had anti-Semitic statements from the high-level official governmental um, officials from Vladimir Putin, the Russian president himself, some kinds of um, literally dirty anti-Semitic jokes, something like this. Uh, we have seen that the Hamas delegation was in Kremlin uh, several days ago. I think Russia was the only country after the October 7th, which uh, had an official meeting with the Hamas delegation, even, I don't know, Recep Erdogan, uh, who is an um, Islamist in his uh, public rhetoric in Turkey, even you know, with uh, all those great public events in support of Palestine, he refused to provide asylum for Hamas leaders in Turkey, they had to left the country because even Erdogan doesn't want to have anything in common with this terroristic organization, but Russia has. So we have to understand the incident in Mahachkala in this very context. And what does it mean? It means that uh, the, it is not about the level of anti-Semitism in the Russian society. We don't have enough objective, clear information about the uh, social public opinion in Russia. Um, we don't know exactly what um, the Russian society thinks, but what we can see that uh, the Russian government can very effectively to provide some image of enemy for the society. 15 years ago, it was uh, Ethnic Georgians and the level of Kafkazophobia in Russia was um, horrible. 
Uh, during the last 10 years, it is Ukrainophobic propaganda, which led to horrible acts of massacre like in Bucha and so on. Uh, now we can see that you know, the Russian government, again, as in Soviet time, allows anti-Semitism. So it became a kind of a Lego channel for all the frustration and aggression they have in uh, the Russian society. And uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict is uh, just a trigger. It is not a real reason or real root of the uh, anti-Semitism in Russia. The real reason is that this government legitimize itself by hatred. They don't have a normal type of democratic legitimization uh, by the elections, by the different, I don't know, political programs, whatever. Uh, this type of societies, like in Russia, like in Gaza itself, like in Iran, like in Syria, like in North Korea, you name it, they have hatred as a source of their legitimization. So they need to this incitement to hatred from the top, from the officials, from the government, uh, because they don't have uh, another instruments to found their popularity in the society. They can consolidate society only by hatred. So it is the context uh, which helps us to understand what have we seen in Mahachkala or in Russia in general during the last days and weeks. My second question is about your book, uh, Political Antisemitism in Post-Soviet Russia, Actors and Ideas in 1991-2003, and a bit in the context of the current events, perhaps. Uh, you know, uh, now it is more about, uh, like, contemporary history than about the current situation. Not only because the book was published 20 years ago, but because uh, the situation in Russia, the political context, uh, has changed dramatically. These first decade after the collapse of the Soviet Union was the period when uh, Russia tried to be more or less democratic country, at least in a uh, sense of uh, different pluralistic, uh, different voices in their media, uh, a kind of a political competition using different ideologies. Of course, it was not really a free society, uh, but their level of freedom of speech and political life was maybe the best one in the Russian history ever. Literally. During the last 20 years, all this pluralism, all this uh, diversity had been oppressed, repressed, or just um, uh, became silent. Uh, so what we have is more, uh, we can compare uh, more with the Soviet period, when it was a kind of uh, ideological control over all the media. Of course, the media has changed, the technology uh, has changed, but uh, the principle that um, the government has monopoly, monopoly for hatred as well, is the same. During Soviet time, the official anti-Zionist, as they call it, ideology, which really meant the ideology of state anti-Semitism, was an important part of the ideology of the Soviet Communist Party. It was more or less logic in their ideological struggle against capitalism. It had a kind of background in early socialistic theories which were full of anti-Semitic ideas because of this... Um, identification of capitalism with the Jewish capital and so on. So it was kind of a natural phenomena in the Russian communistic ideology. 
And now in Russia, we can see a very funny and interesting phenomenon when this ideological framework has gone, but the hatred remain inside without any logical background, without any foundation on the ideas of historical procedures. Uh, they just very they just uh, instrumentalized hatred. They just learned how to use it to build society that they will be easy and comfortable to rule. And, and that's it. It is what we see now in Russia. And it is why they can very easy change directions of this hatred. Today it is Ukraine, tomorrow it is Baltic countries or Poland or well, anti-Western uh, sentiments, they remain more or less stable. Uh, but uh, several years ago, uh, nothing told us um, that anti-Semitism will be a part of official uh, rhetoric on the um, Kremlin. But now it is, that is just without any background, but it is just because it is effective to use it in an internal propaganda. The last question, given your expertise and knowledge, can you share some key insights with our Western audience to help them better understand the situation, including, say, distinctions between a Jews as an ethnic category as perceived in the former Soviet Union and traditionally now, say, in Russia and Ukraine and the religion as in the West or uh, Putin's perceived stance on anti-Semitism or the dynamics involving Dagestan and Caucasus or whatever you find the most important points here? I think the most important thing is that the Western audience uh, need to realize that there is no independent actors in the Russian politics. When you can hear that, I don't know, Dmitry Ragozin or somebody else or speaker of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Maria Zaharo said something bad about Jews. It is not because of their personal feelings. It is not because that they belong to some anti-Semitic branch of the government, but some others actors are not. Uh, it is they don't uh, have any ideology. They uh, play some public roles and they don't have their own sympathy and antipathy. They are not independent, even in showing their hatred. Uh, they uh, play in the general scene, in the general decoration for uh, the uh, Kremlin's type, very specific Kremlin type of instrumentalization of ideology and public rhetoric. So it is not because of when we can see uh, some uh, horrible videos from Mahachkala, it is not because of the traditions of the Russian anti-Semitism, it is not because of feelings of Muslim part of uh, the Russian society. It is because the government allowed some groups to show this hatred. Uh, so uh, never mind what and who are the Russian Jews, not only in Russia, in post-Soviet countries, in Eastern European countries, Jewry is less religious. It is more like um, ethnic, or cultural category. It means on a practical level only that uh, it is easier for anti-Semites to find the hidden Jews because they don't have a formal or visible attributes. If you don't know that Vladimir Zelensky is an ethnic Jew, you will not think about it. 
So it is just a situation when Jews are more, not more active, but more natural part of the society. They just uh, as uh, like any, everybody other. Uh, but for anti-Semites, it means that uh, it's much more interesting to try to find some Jewish roots of any public figure you don't like, and it provokes a kind of conspirological type thinking. And conspirology is also, or, or, or any type of conspiracy theories, including anti-Semitic ones, is an important part of a Russian mass culture. And they became extremely popular during last years, not only in the context of pandemia or, or the war, um, but uh, because in the societies where the informational space is controlled by the government, people try to find any alternative views, alternative views on history, alternative views on politics, alternative views on health or whatever. So this type of conspiracy theories, including anti-Semitic ones, they are really uh, popular in Russia and they also create the general cultural uh, context where it is so easy to provide this incitement of hatred against Jews, but not only against Jews, but against any group of enemies of uh, the Russian government. We can remind the level of homophobia and the homophobic campaign the Russian government provided for last decade. So it is not because of the characteristics of this group which uh, will be a symbol of uh, enemies. It is uh, because this government needs the direction to channelize the frustration and aggressiveness of the society. Thank you so much. It's so clear and precise and a lot of food for thought. I hope that our audience has enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you so much, Vyacheslav. Zarina Zabriski with Vyacheslav Likachov. And many thanks to Zarina for sharing her war diary with us. You can follow her on X at Zarina Zabriski. I'm Adrian Goldberg. This has been a We Bring Audio production for the Byline Times. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for listening. Bye now.